reason I was thinking five eighths of an inch was just over 16, but uh, quick look at the Zeus book, and five eighths is just under 16. Yeah, losing my touch. I've uh, got a 16 mil most tape two drill, and I'm hoping. But uh, this will give me oversize on 16 by just point one or something. We'll have a look. So running about 800 RPM, and I'm going to go straight through with a 16 mil drill now into that 10. I know I'm going to have to have two pecs at this because I'm running out of travel again. Yeah. Take it a bit gentler when I break through the power end. Okay. Let's see what size it came out at. Hard to get a feel with this plastic. 16.1 I'm getting. That'll be fine. That'll be clearance on the lead screw. So we've got a chamfer on the front edge, I chamfered the back of that, I need some chamfers on the other end and on that bore now. So I think I can chamfer that bore quite simply. So slow things up a bit, just put a little chamfer on the bore. There we go. And that can come out of the chuck. chamfer on the other end, probably do that by hand. Excellent. And that is the first part done. So the next part will have a bore through it, stopping short of the end, and the end will have a smaller bore which fits on there, and the larger bore will fit on there. So this will go right through in the inside of it and come out and so on and so forth, it'll get bigger and bigger and when they're all pushed up they will all close one inside the other this will go into the next one along, the next one will go on so on and so on, forth the largest one will be clamped to this end, the smallest one to this end so I think that's probably given us a video full for now I'll go on and make the others and then we'll show you the sort of sub-assembly uh, the only drawback with this is that I'm going to have to take out the uh, lead screw or certainly remove the end of the carriage and the uh, end of the lead screw housing to be able to slide them onto the lead screw at a later date. But we'll worry about that when we get to it. Okay. So I've just quickly machined up the second size, the number two size. Same length, same shoulders, what have you, but obviously the neck size up. Now, the small part of the first one has to fit when it goes in from the back through the bore in the front. So I'm going to do a short area, two millimetres wide again, the same width as the heads, and a diameter to fit that. Then I'll part it off, turn it round, bore it out in a clearance to within two mil of the front face to take the larger diameter, and then this will fit inside that to the front point, as it were. So I've got the boring bar up. I'm just having a scratch at it. I think I've got a little bit left to come out. Let's just take 0.2 out. I'm only boring it 10 mil deep. That'll do. We'll have a little, uh, a little measure in there, see where we are. Get it somewhere close and then we'll do a, a suck it and see fit, as it were. That's coming out with 19 and a half mil. And I know that diameter is 20, so I'll take another 0.2 aside. Measure that, get the bowling bar out of my way. 
from that is measuring on my little stick here 19.84 I'll just try that I want just a, a little running fit uh, I'll take another point one I'll take point one five out of it and this is the suck it and see fit no bit of a sharp edge on there but there is a chamfer on the end of the part so if it's going to go it would go take a power saw out of it barely scratching that and we'll try it again that actually fits in there as you can see and well it's picking up the, the sort of ridges slightly from the turning tools I think just a, a tiniest little scratch maybe another slab I'm going to set a zero there on diameter. That's better. Okay, I'm going to hacksaw this off and then leaving my boring bar, I know I need half mil out of the diameter or half mil cut from where I am. So I'll just line the parting tool up now. That front edge, there we are. Give myself a zero. I'm going to come back again. I'm going to do 56 mil. Leave a bit for a uh, little bit for facing the back edge afterwards. Tighten up the carriage and we'll part her off. so drilled it just about right so now I need to bore out from this side to within two mil of the face to take the larger diameter after I've skimmed that head to thickness of two mil again so we'll have that and then take it out the chuck Put this one up that way around and carry on so there we are that's the first two pieces done of the telescopic lead screw cover Let's see if i can come in around the camera and pop the two apart there we are so yeah small top hat that's 16 and a bit all the way through that'll fit the size of the lead screw just trying to line up the front and the back at the same time there she goes and extends right out and right back to the back not too much give in it that's going to work absolutely perfect I'm sure that's going to bed in and become uh, softer as we go along so this is two of six which is going to make up the 300 mil long as you can see the first two make up 108 um, I'm not worried if it's you know 20 30 mil longer the overall uh, and when it's closed right up, it'll drop right back to the 55 mil, which is my minimum size. So happy days. There we are so far. We've done the first four. Two more parts to make. And we'll have the six pieces, which will cover the 300 plus mil that we need to cover. So yeah, I mean, as, as they say, they're telescopic. <laughs> very, very similar to the design of a telescope. I need a few little radiuses and what have you. They do stick here and there um so yeah i'll have a little fiddle with it a little play with it and 
Oh, it's just if they go right in and out, I probably need a little bit larger chamfer on the front edges just to stop them sticking when they come through. So we had a little catastrophe. My tube light failed in the workshop here. But not to worry. Went out to buy a bulb. And it was a bulb that I couldn't find on the shelf anyway. It was a, a five foot T5 tube. I could find four foot ones, not a five foot. So I had to buy some new light fittings. But having said that, a new bulb, um, from what I've seen, is about a tenner. And I bought a complete new fit in here. You can probably see it in shot for £20. And it's an LED with like 10,000 hours. So I shouldn't have that problem again. But while I was at it, I managed to pick up, you can see on the light here, there's another tube going crossways in the shed here. And generally, even though it was a bit of a catastrophe, the, it's just a bulb gone. But when you haven't got one, it's a problem. But I think it was uh, a blessing in disguise because I think the lighting here in the shed is far better now. Um, this bulb here used to be over on the window wall shining outwards in this direction and I'm getting a lot more light off this LED even though it's only like 14 watts. So I think my total light is use in the workshop here. I think that was a 10 watt. This was 14. So 24 watts of light. Plus I got the window open, you know, the... the the Welsh flag curtain away from the window at the moment um, but yeah the lighting's a lot better so hopefully we'll get a bit more quality on the videos without me being stood in the shadows like I have been in the past I almost forgot I was threatening to show you the or a watch out of my watch collection so we'll start with this one and this is the oldest watch that I have now this is a Certina watch um, I believe they were founded in 1888 in Gretchen, Switzerland. Anyway, this particular watch is, to the best of my knowledge, and as much as I can work out from the serial number, is 1952. So it's, uh, it's got, you know, a good bit, of, uh, good bit of age to it. In fact, it's uh, quite a bit older than I am. Anyway, it's base metal case. Um, it's brass, I believe. It's showing some signs of wear. Uh, it's got like a, a chromium plating on it, or, you know, a silver coloured plating. Uh, it's wearing through where it's been worn over the years. I put a new strap on it, you know, a new black leather strap. The one that was uh, on it when I bought it was uh, looking a bit tatty. Um, manual winding watch. And it's just nice to have a bit of Swiss made quality history behind it, uh, being a Satina. I believe over the years they've made uh, movements for various other companies. Uh, the American company Hamilton used Satina movements at one time. But yeah, that's the, the first one out of my collection. And that's uh, a manual winding Satina. No complications at all. No day, date, anything like that. A very basic watch. Um, but got a great age to it. And it still works perfectly. Again, on the subject of watches, I said I'm uh, going about restoring my old clunker, as it were. Um, this is a watch I've had for 30 odd years. It's a Pulsar Diver watch, um, water resistance to 200 meters, so it's got, you know, it, it pretty much, I've worn it everywhere in water, swam with it, done all sorts, it's never leaked. Um, it's a quartz movement, it's been dead for so long, the battery in it, maybe a year or so, and I put a new battery in and it didn't work, I played with it, done a few bits and bobs, got it on the old magnetic spinny thing in the local uh, local shop. Um, which is supposed to kickstart them to go again and it didn't work so the movement is shot so that was what pretty much led me on to okay let's repair it so I've managed to buy a new movement um, brand new movement for it um, I'm gonna have to strip it all apart take the face off the hands off the winder out new movement face back on hands back on all the rest of it that's gonna be a bit of fun I'm gonna have to get the serious magnifying glasses out for that I've taken the bezel off, as you can see it's the sort of Pepsi style, um, taken the bezel off, it was full of muck in there, it still wants a, a good clean this lot. The bezel is fairly scratched, um, tempted to replace it, but then again, I think that's going to give it its character. Um, I'll just give it a damn good clean and polish it up. The face was very, very badly scratched. Um, it's a... Uh, Basically all the guts and innards of all this and the case even and everything else is all Seiko And it the glass or the crystal as they call it is a, a Seiko Hardlex, I believe it's not the acrylic type that you can um, you know polish out very easily So I've spent hours and hours 
um, with a sheet of wet and dry on a sheet of glass, 400 grit, and uh, basically polishing it. It's a flat glass, and I've got 99% of the scratches out. There's a few little dimples, I believe, in places. I can see a few specks where um, weld spatter has gone onto it, I believe, or something like that over the years, but I think I don't want to grind all that out because I don't want to make the lens too thin. And again, I've got this uh, Jeweler's Rouge, which is a, a very, very, very fine polishing paste, which does cut the glass quite nicely. And after wet and drying it, as you can imagine, it was just foggy. Even down to a thousand grit, it was just a foggy appearance. Polishing up again with a cloth, with a Jeweler's Rouge, as it's called. Um, probably spent half an hour and it's brought it back up to a clear lens. Strap needs a bit of work, tighten up some links and what have you. So, yeah, I've got the movement. I've got new rubber gaskets, it being a waterproof uh, waterproof watch. Um, the size I want is in this packet. That was like two pound bought online again for multiples of uh, watch gaskets. So, yeah, I mean, I'm going to be restoring that and I'll probably show you what it looks like when I'm finished. Well, here we are. That's the first four pieces done. Four down, two to go. Well, I do hope you found this interesting, and if you want to see more of the watches or what have you, let me know in the comments below. I can either put it in, leave it out, you know, but if there's enough people interested in it, I'll keep showing them, you know, in various episodes, just little snippets here and there. May I take this opportunity once more to say a Happy New Year to you all, and may I say thanks to you all for watching and all for subscribing. Thanks now.